good morning. I want to welcome all of you to our worship service this morning. Those of you who are worshiping with us online, we want to do well. The first song this morning will be number 618. 618. <laughs> treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal for where your treasure is there your heart will be also the lamp of the body is the eye if therefore your eye is good your whole body will fulfill will be full of light but if your eye is bad your whole body will be full of darkness if therefore the light that is in you is darkness how great is that darkness no one can serve two masters for Either he will have, he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor the spin, and yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today... 
which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day it is its own trouble. I will have a prayer. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for taking care of us. Thank you for all the blessings of life that you know we need, that you, you take care of us each day of food, clothing, and shelter. Thank you for the measure of health you've given each one of us this morning that enables us to meet here together in this assembly of your children here at Ephesus. And we pray, Father, that our worship this morning will be in spirit and in truth and be pleased and accept in your sight and come up to you as a sweet-smelling savor in your sight this morning. Thank you again for each family here. Thank you for Brother Robert and Brother Matt as they labor with us here and bring us lessons from time to time and uh, give them a good and useful life in your service. I bless those that uh, follow that are, are sick and would like to be here but can't. We, uh, lay your healing hand upon them for be your will and their health can be restored. If not, Father, we pray that their suffering will be light and most of all that their soul will be at peace with you. Be with the class teachers this morning. Give them a good recollection of things they've studied. They can present them in a way that we as students may get the good, most good they're from. Help us as students, not Father, not to be hearers only, but to be doers of your word. Father, we pray your blessings on our country, our leaders, our president, and all those in high authority, that they will seek your uh, guidance in their decisions and Father, if it be your will, we can have a, a greater amount of peace in our, the world than we have at this time. Be with those that are considered our enemies, that they will see the need for peace and work toward that end. Father, continue with us now and through this class period and on through future life. When we've come to the end of life's way, by your grace and mercy, give us a home in heaven. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We are glad you're here. It's already been mentioned. Appreciate those that join us online to study as well. But we are in the book of First Timothy. Uh, is there anybody that does not have a lesson sheet on chapter three? Anybody need a lesson sheet on three? If anybody has, okay. If you have a lesson sheet on chapter four, if you'll share it with me, I won't have to write one. Because I don't have four done yet. Here we go. 
You got oh, it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We are ready for chapter 3 uh, of the book of 1 Timothy. Uh, this is a chapter that deals with uh, elders and deacons primarily. Uh, the last few verses with other things, but for the most part it is dealing with that. Uh, we have just recently, as you all know, uh, had a number of lessons that we dealt with this already. because they expressed a desire that they wanted to serve. It's like, you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be wanting to, to have that position. You shouldn't be wanting to have that job. But Paul says that's a good thing. And, and so it's, uh, it is something that it should be. I, I believe that this is something that maybe we have failed on over the years, is impressing the importance of this and the desire to do this with our young people. Uh, because I think young people need to be taught this is something you need to work toward. Uh, as most of you know, my daddy was a preacher my whole life growing up, and somebody said something to him about his sons being preachers, and he said that would be good, but I'd a whole lot rather see my sons be elders than I would preachers. Uh, and he said they can do both, but he said I really would like to see them become elders. And, and so I think that it's, it is a work that, that carries a lot of responsibility but it's a work that a Christian should, if it's a Christian man and he feels like he's qualified, then he should want to do that. And it is a good thing to want to do that. And that's, I think that's important. Uh, and certainly the other side of that is you don't want to coerce somebody into taking it. And I have known of congregations where they, you know, maybe had two people that were qualified in the whole congregation and one of them didn't really want to. But in order to have elders, the, this one was really pushed into taking it uh, and then really wished he had not and really did not have the, he just didn't have the time with his other responsibilities to do the job and do it right. Uh, and and he, he regretted having taken it. And that's a, that's a bad thing. It's a bad situation. So it, it's, it's both sides of the desire. Now, that he said it is a fine or good what? Work, okay. I think 
this also emphasizes something about the position of being an elder is it is a work to be done. It's not a title to be to attain or just some kind of label to put on your name. Uh, it, it's something that is, is a work, a responsibility, and it's a very serious work and very serious responsibility. And so it is something that, that a man should desire to do. Now, the, somebody asked me a question just a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about elders and talking about appointing elders and so on, and, and somebody said, what part of the qualifications of an elder do not actually fit what every Christian should be? And the fact is, there are very few of them. There are a few specific to family situations that, that not every Christian has to have. But otherwise, with these, those exceptions related to family, every single thing that's listed is something that every one of us as Christians should, should aspire to have and be and do in our lives. So it's just it's something that should fit all of us. Okay. There are other terms in the New Testament for overseer. Uh, the term overseer or bishop is used here in this passage. There are other terms that are used. We don't normally refer to the people in the local congregation as being bishops. Uh, or overseers. Sometimes I've heard those terms used, but not very often. Uh, what's another term that is used? Okay, pastors. Okay. Now that's a term that is used in a different sense in most religious groups of our day. Uh, the, the pastor of most churches is the one person who is He's really the administrator uh, of that church, is what he is. He is he's generally the, the main preacher, but he's also generally is the one who uh, is responsible for, for taking care of all the day-to-day -day activities of running the church. And so it would be sort of like the president or CEO of a corporation, and that's his job is to manage and run in the affairs of the daily thing. Most of these have some kind of board. Sometimes it's a board of deacons. Sometimes it's a board of elders. Sometimes it's a board of uh, just a board of directors or some kind of board that oversees the pastor, and, and they make the major decisions, but he runs the show pretty much daily. That's not the way it is in Scripture. There's another term for pastor, another word, actually the same word in the Greek is translated two different ways. Pastor is one of them. What's the other one? It means the same thing. Actually, shepherd. Yeah, a shepherd. If you think about it, uh, a shepherd pastors the flock. That's what he does. Uh, and, and so if you look at it, and, and there's several passages, one of them, is Acts 20 and verse eight, uh, 28. Uh, if, if you'll turn over to Acts 20 and verse 28, there where uh, Paul, and, and this is a good one because uh, if, if you look at Acts 20, verse 17 in, in Acts chapter 20, it says, From Miletus he sent, that's talking about Paul, he sent to Ephesus and called to him the elders of the church. So we know he's, he's talking to the elders of the church from Ephesus. And so when you drop down to verse 28, he says, Be on guard for yourselves and for the flock, among whom the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. And so here he says, you are overseers, which is the same word that is translated as bishops. He says you're elders, which is what he called for. But he also says your responsibility is to shepherd the flock, which is the same as pastor. So all three of these terms that are used in different ways are incorporated in this one passage talking about the same people. Uh, the same thing is true over in 1 Peter. Uh, if you go over to 1 Peter 5, there, in, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, 
He says, Therefore I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and partaker of the glories to be revealed. So Peter says, Okay, I'm talking to the elders. I also am an elder and I'm, I'm talking to you. He says, Shepherd or pastor the flock of God among you, not under compulsion, but voluntarily according to the will of God and not for sordid gain yet with eagerness, nor yet is lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples of the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you'll receive the crown, uh, the unfading crown of glory. So you have two or three of these terms used in that one context. So throughout the New Testament, you have the terms used interchangeably as bishop or overseer, which is one Greek word translated two different ways. You have shepherd and pastor, which is one Greek word translated two different ways. Or you have presbyter and elder, which is one word translated two different ways. So you really have three Greek words, you have six English words. Uh, and it depends on which translation of the Bible you're using as to which of these is translated how and, and, and so on and how much. The, what is the significance of one being a bishop or an overseer? What, what's the significance of that? Okay, yeah, the, they have the oversight. And, and so the very word itself carries with it the idea of, of what their job is. And I, I think that's something um, that, that we need to see as we go through the, the qualifications is what's the responsibility? How does this relate to their job? And so the very name itself as an overseer tells you a big part of what their job is. What does shepherd mean? What does a shepherd do? He feeds the flock. He protects the flock. He, guide, he leads them. He guides them. He helps them uh, find what they need. So uh, there's all kinds of implications with the shepherd. Uh, and so he says that you are to shepherd the flock. Uh, a presbyter or an elder, what, what would be the significance of that? This sort of has an Old Testament ring to it. Okay, the theoretically, as we get older, we get wiser. <laughs> I say theoretically because sometimes that's not always true, but generally we do. Do what, Donnie? <laughs> wiser, okay, yeah. If, if you go back to the Old Testament, did you want to come make coming out loud? Okay. Uh, I thought that was just an under your breath mumble. Uh, if, you, if you go back to the Old Testament and you look, each tribe had elders. Each family within the tribe had elders. Each city had elders. Uh, and so you find the idea of elders all through the Old Testament uh, among the Israelites. And so for that concept to be used is only natural. Uh, that God would say, okay, you need elders, that is, they need to be men who are older, they're wiser. And of course, one of the, one of the qualifications is not a novice, which would uh, in itself eliminate a lot of the younger people, uh, but it also has other implications as well. But, but it certainly would, would eliminate a lot of the younger people uh, from that standpoint. So it is to be a man that is older. It also... One, one thing I looked up said uh, that it carries with it the idea of dignity and experience, which has to do with the wisdom we talked about. So it has to do with age, it has to do with experience, or wisdom has to do with the dignity of, of, of who a person is and so on. All right, any question, anything on the end of that? Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's uh, it certainly is a designation of who they are, and and probably it, even though it's not the same original word, it probably carries with it a whole lot the same significance as an overseer, a person who is your leader is your overseer. He's the one that, uh, and and also the idea of a shepherd, uh, it would carry with that same idea as well. Yeah, Hebrews uh, thirteen does talk about that, and I actually had that verse down and I, I didn't I had it in the margin so I didn't see it but I had had that same thing down there. Yeah. So you have to look for the sheep that's in wolf's clothing no the wolf that's in sheep's clothing because we have several classes we need to know what's going on in there and you know what I mean? 
Yeah. Yeah, and, and as, as an overseer, it means that he is supposed to know what's going on. You can't oversee something if you don't know what's going on. Uh, we recently did an event at school, and I was responsible for making sure it happened, and I had a whole lot of people under me working to make it happen, and so every two or three days, I'd have two or three of the key people come in my office and say, okay, Tell me where we are, what, what's going on, you know, what, what's done, what needs to be done, where are we with this, where are we with this. And, and it, that's, that's overseeing. I didn't do the, each individual little task. It's not the elder's job to teach all of the Bible classes. It's not the elder's job to make sure that this person does that or something else. But it is the responsibility of the elders to make sure that all of it gets done. Uh, and gets done properly and, and appropriately. And so what Vernon mentioned certainly is an extremely important part of it, and that is to know what's being taught. Uh, if we're going to feed the flock, we have to know what's being fed. Uh, first of all, I've got to know they are being fed, and secondly, what are they being fed? Uh, and, and so it is a responsibility of, of the elders to make sure and and sometimes I think, uh, and I've known of situations where this was true, not here at Ephesus, but other places, where the elders were very diligent about making sure what was being preached from the pulpit was right, but they really didn't have much clue what was going on in the Bible classes. Uh, and that's, that can be probably more dangerous than what's coming from the pulpit. So uh, it's, it's something that we, as elders, need to know what's going on and need to make sure that it, it is the right thing. The teachers need to understand, you know, if we go through their classes, see what they are teaching. It's not that we're scared of them. It's just our job to say, you're doing the right thing or yeah. doing the right thing. And they need to understand that. Yeah. Not be intimidated. Not be intimidated, yes. And, and again, it's, it's something that, you know, it's, it, it sort of go back, go back to the illustration I just used with, with what I just did. You know, it, it wasn't my place to micromanage everybody's job that they were doing. It's just, you know, this is what needs to be done. Can you take care of that? Yes, okay, you got it. Can you take care of this? Yes, you got it. And, and so we do need to know. But you also need to know, and there were some th times that I would ask some pretty detailed questions. I'd say, okay, what about this, 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 and this? Uh, and, you know, and they say, okay, this one we're doing this, this we're doing this, and this was okay, that's fine, you know. Uh, and, but I needed to know those things to make sure it was being done the way it needed to be done. Uh, and as an elder, the same thing is true. We need to know, as an elder, what is going on and what's being taught, and so. And the only way you can know is to ask, either be in the class or to ask questions about it. You can't find out any other way, because generally, if you hear about it from a third party, it's already too late. It means you got problems usually. All right, what does it mean? One of the the first things that is said there, in verse two. An overseer then must be above reproach. Uh, some translations say an overseer must be blameless. What does it mean to be above reproach or to be blameless? Okay, a good reputation. That's one of the things says to, is to be a good reputation. Uh, okay, a good name among those community, and that would be Again, that goes a little later. He talks about the fact that they are to have a good reputation of those without, and, and that certainly is a part of being blameless. If, if you say somebody is blameless or they are above reproach, it, it almost implies that, that they're perfect and they don't make mistakes. Means they're going to try hard not to. Okay, they're going to try hard not to, yeah. Uh, how, how many of us are perfect and don't make mistakes? None of us. It doesn't make any difference who we are or what our position or job or work or, or anything else is. We, you know, we all make mistakes and we all do things sometimes we maybe shouldn't do or say something we shouldn't have said. And, and so, and, and I've heard, and I, the reason that I even mention this like I do is because I have been in congregations where basically the interpretation of this that was used in trying to seek out elders was this person has to be perfect. And if anybody could find any, any fault with that person as far back as you want to dig, then they say, well, he's not qualified because he did this or he did that or he said this or, or whatever. 
if, if that's the way we're going to do it and it means perfect, then we're not ever going to appoint anybody for elders. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Don, Donnie said a, a lot of it has to do with whether or not a person is willing to admit they're wrong or, or to change, to repent. You know, you think about David, a man after God's own heart, and then you look at the terrible sins David committed in his life. But but when he recognized what he had done wrong and it was brought to his attention, he said, "I have sinned." Don, uh, sorry. Yes, uh, we, we have a lot to be thankful for here. And, and in the years that I've been here at Ephesus, we have gone through cycles. Uh, we've gone through cycles where we had very few young people. We've gone through cycles where we had a lot of young people. We've gone through cycles where we had, you know, this age, but not this age. I can remember at one point, I, I think maybe we had two teenagers in, in the whole congregation, you know, and, and that's not good. But we had a whole bunch of little bitty kids coming along, you know. And then later we had a group where we had a whole bunch of teenagers, and, and now those teenagers are giving us a whole bunch of little kids. So we got, <laughs> you go through these cycles in, in any group like this, and especially in a, in a church like this. But, yes, I think we need to be very thankful for what we have, and we need to work very hard to, to try to maintain what we have from the standpoint of a church that cares about each other and make it attractive for our young people to want to stay here. I know that with job situations the way they are in this world today that many times people move off and go other places and that's going to happen with a certain percentage of, of our young people and you just know it is. But at the same time, it needs to be attractive for others to come in because if you don't have any young people, then you, you do exactly what Tommy was talking about. You reach a point where you've got 14 old people and that's it. And, uh, and that makes it almost impossible for... To, to make it regrow like it should. Uh, if, if you are a parent with young people, and especially in this area where there are so many churches to choose from, uh, which church are you more than likely, or what are you going to be looking for in a church if you're a parent with some young people? You're going to be looking for one that's got more young people. You're right. So if, if you have the young people, it attracts more young people. You don't have it it sort of turns them away. Uh, and, and there have been times that we've had people that uh, have told me that, you know, I really like Ephesus and I really like being a part of it, but we've got these kids and we really want them to be with these other kids. And, and so they've chosen to go to some other congregation for that very reason. So, yeah, I, I think that, that all of that plays a part. In, anyway, uh, but yes, we need to be thankful for that. All right, above reproach does not mean perfect. It just means a person who's trying to live right, trying to do what's right. Uh, and yeah, they've made some mistakes, but if they realize that they're willing to admit it and repent of it, change it, do what's right, uh, and it, it does not mean that a person is uh, completely free from faults of any kind. Uh, one thing that I, I, I made a note here, I said no obvious charges. In other words, there's not something about that person's life that he obviously is not doing right or he is doing wrong and, and somebody could openly make a charge against that person. Yeah. How far do you go back? How far do you go back? You mean like in a person's life? I would say you go for as far back as a person has committed sin without repenting. I think once they've repented, then that's gone. You, you forget that. Now, now if, 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 let's say, for example, let's say you had a young man that, that got on drugs and he got off of them, and then when he's 
28 years old, he gets back on drugs again, and he gets off of them. And then when he's 35, he gets back on drugs again, and he gets off of them. And he gets 50, you know, and he's just gotten off of drugs again. And somebody says, hey, let's make him an elder. He's repented. I say, well, you know, we need to be careful. And, and I, if I were that man, I would say, you know, let me, let's, you know, I, I'm trying to do right, but let's not do that because I think you could, you'd be open to, to a, a bad reputation of people without and, and so on. Even though I personally would accept him, if he said he's repented, I'd accept him in, with open arms. But I, I think you have to use some good judgment depending on what is. But for the most part, let's say that, you know, some guy got in some kind of trouble when he was in his 20s and uh, maybe even served a little time or something else and he gets out and he gets his life straight and he's trying to live right. He's, he's blameless. He's above reproach as long as he's living right and trying to do what's right in spite of what he did back there. You know. And I think that's true to a large extent with all of these qualifications, or almost all these qualifications. And in fact, I, we were discussing, I and I were discussing the qualifications of elders with somebody here a few weeks ago that's not a member here at Ephesus at all. In fact, they're from out of town. And uh, he, he made the statement, he said, I think these are more just general guidelines and principles of the kind of person that ought to be an elder. And to a large degree, I agree with that. Uh, I do believe that there are some specifics here. But I think a lot of these things that are given are, are just sort of general statements about this is the kind of person that needs to be there. Uh, all right, let's look, look. What are some of the positive qualifications? Self-control. Self-control, okay. That, that's one. Uh, some translations use the word temperate. Uh, but self-control, why would that be necessary for a man to effectively serve as a bishop or an overseer or an elder or whatever you want to call it. Okay. Uh, you, you don't blow your stack very easily. Uh, in fact, if you look at the negative qualifications, there's two of them there. One of them is a word that if in the New American Standard, at least a word that we never use. Uh, I've never heard it used in any context other than talking about qualifications of elders. But in the New American Standards, it says not pugnacious. Uh, and that's not a word that we use very often. Uh, and the word that followed, the one that follows that is not contentious. Uh, what, are, what do those mean? Not quick tempered, not easily angered, doesn't blow his stack over every little thing, you know. And, and, and so I think that, that when you, you look at a person who is self controlled, He's going to be a person that doesn't do that. If a person does do those things, then he doesn't have the temperance or self-control. And then that's something that you learn. You know, the, the, a lot of people just by temperament are very quick-tempered. I mean, that's just their nature. It's the way they're made. Now, other people are made by nature to be very patient. Uh, but the fact is we can learn to be patient even if we are naturally quick-tempered. Uh, and it's not an easy task, but it is something that we can do. We can learn to control that. Uh, and, and so it has to be somebody, whether whether he's naturally self-controlled and, and temperate or if he's practiced and learned to do it, it certainly needs to be that kind of a person. temper and when they were young he used to make him lose his temper at least a couple of times a day uh, just for the fun of it because Tommy was patient and 
Uh, I had a brother very similar to that that it didn't take much to light his fuse. And uh, you could run faster than him. I don't know that I could, but that's uh, my brother. But, uh, yeah, that's, you know, that. Uh, but people grow. And then now his brother is an elder, has been for many years, and is very uh, self-controlled with his temper. Well, that's that's a part of spiritual growth. And, uh, I, you know, I've told you before, my daddy was, and I didn't know this. He, I never saw it in him. But he told me, he said, when I was young, I was very hot-tempered. He said, but I had to learn to control it and learn to not be that way. Well, I, you know, I never saw my daddy hot-tempered. Uh, so he learned it before I came along. But at some point, he said, you know, he had been, and he had to work on it. Yeah. Right. A lot of it comes with maturity physically and spiritually, Donnie said. And that's absolutely true, which is why you want somebody that is older, somebody that has some experience and stuff. All right, what's another qualification that's given? Yeah, okay, temperate, yeah. In fact, I think some translations actually put self-control there instead of temperate. So, yeah, that's, that's what we've just talked about. All right, any others? Prudent, prudent okay. What does prudent mean? Wise, Wise okay. Knows how to use good judgment. Cares about, the cares about the future. Okay. Yeah. Uh, cares about the future. And that, that is sort of the motivation behind making good decisions is, is because you look to the future and, and, and so on. All right. Anything else? Must be just or fair-minded. Okay. Just or fair-minded. All right. Uh, and, and again, that's very closely related to this prudent uh, you gotta got to be just and fair-minded and want to do what's right. All right, uh, let's stop right there. Uh, and Lord willing, we will pick up with those. Uh, and talk about some others, uh, both positive and negative, next week. Lord willing. everybody out this morning. Uh, I want to say happy Mother's Day to all the mothers in the audience and that are listening online. We're thankful to, for you. Without you, we wouldn't be here. i um, like to thank everybody for being here this morning and thank everybody that are online with us. Uh, we're grateful for that as well. Got a few announcements this morning. Um, first off, Rebecca Biggerstaff, uh, she went back to the hospital and she is now in room 206 and she is doing some better. Um, Joyce DeMint, she had gallbladder surgery last week. Um, I'm not going to be here next Sunday, so if you have any announcements, give them to Brendan Kirby. He's going to be uh, doing the announcements for me. Um, there's a big announcement about the Elk River Health and Nursing Center. Uh, service. Um, I have a sheet on the back foyer back there where the sign up list is for the song leader and the um, yeah making the talk thing. If you will just read it. I'm not going to go over the whole details um, but that's every fifth Sunday of the month and that'll be uh, July the May the 29th, July the 31st, and October the 30th. So we need men to sign up for that. And we also need men, I noticed, uh, to sign up for opening and closing the building. There's still several empty spots, so men, please step up and sign your name to open and close the building. Um, 
On the back of the bulletin, we would like to congratulate all of our graduates that we have uh, in this congregation. We have them from pre-K all the way up to college. So if you want to know who those are, uh, just grab a bulletin and look at the back. And uh, we're thankful for them, and I'm sure that they're happy to be graduating. I have another announcement here. Uh, as we announced a couple of weeks ago, Odessa Birdwell is on kidney dialysis and requires someone to be with her pretty much all the time. Brother Felix Birdwell is her primary caregiver but has some problems of his own. We understood that he was going to have eye surgery last week but that was not scheduled at the time. It is still a few weeks out. Uh, he is still planning on having the eye surgery. Uh, Brother Felix has not been able to do his work as a deacon for quite a while and says that he does not know if he will ever be able to do it again. So he is dropping off as a deacon and his work has been re reassigned to another to other deacons. We greatly appreciate all the work Felix has done for God and at Ephesus over the years. Please keep both Felix and Odessa in our prayers. That's all the announcements I have this morning. Are there any other announcements before I turn it over to Brother Matt? There came a time where man's thoughts and intentions were nothing but evil. But God looked over the world and saw that there was a man by the name of Noah. And he gave Noah a job to do, and Noah built an ark. And within that ark, God would preserve mankind for the next generations. After the waters had washed the world and Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives and all the animals upon the ark had successfully been saved. Noah offers up an offering to God. And God sees this offering and the sacrifice and the sweet-smelling aroma pleased God. And God formed a covenant. In Genesis chapter 9, we find out about that covenant and what it is and how God looked at the world it says in verse 12 God said this is the sign of the covenant which I make between you me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations I set my rainbow in the cloud and it shall be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth now there's not very many people that I I know and as a matter of fact I've never met anybody who goes oh well there's a rainbow that's depressing uh, most of everyone uh, gets excited about a rainbow uh, you may not be excited about the rain or maybe it comes at a bad time or or maybe you you uh, look at it and say well I wish the rain would last a little bit longer but there's there's the rainbow and it, it's the clouds are peeling back and everyone enjoys a rainbow but this rainbow oftentimes is set up as maybe some other sign or, or a different wonder. Maybe we think about uh, different practices and groups that have tried to claim the rainbow as their own. Or, or maybe people that search for the end of the rainbow and to find their pot of gold. But the rainbow is a reminder of the covenant between God and earth and what it means. So God had set up this rainbow as a perpetual covenant and to remember for perpetual generations what happened before how man was saved and how God had said this will happen no more in no such fashion will I destroy earth again I will not cause mankind to be wiped out by flood again in the flood Sin caused this great destruction of man. Because man was thinking about sin and about sin all the time, it led to man's destruction. But on the cross, Christ chose to carry the destruction that was set for man so that man could be saved. 
we have a covenant in a like manner that we remember. The rainbow is set up as a, a sign for the covenant between God and earth. We partake of the Lord's Supper as a reminder of the covenant which Christ has gave his blood for, sh saved us by the shedding of his blood. In Luke chapter 22, verse 19, it says this, He took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, The cup, this cup, is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. As surely as the rainbow is a sign of God's redemption of Noah and his family, as a sign that he will not destroy the earth in a similar manner, these emblems represent our redemption. They are a reminder to us the redemption that we have through Jesus Christ and this covenant that we have that was established by the shedding of his blood. The bread and the fruit of the vine shine with the color of hope and of forgiveness. Let us remember the covenant that God has established through his son as we partake of these emblems. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this time that we have set aside to remember your Son, to remember all the things that he did for us, for giving his life on the cross for our sake. And through this act, we have forgiveness of sins and we have a hope of heaven. And Father, at this time, as we take to this bread and we pray that we'll take it in a manner that's pleasing in your sight. We pray all this in Christ's name. Matter, Father, we ask you to bless this cup of fruit of the vine, which to Christians represents the blood that was shed upon the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. Be with us now as we partake of it. We do so in a well pleasing manner. In Christ's name, amen. Our next song will be number nine. Number nine, we'll sing verses one, two, and four. Oh, wonderful Savior. 
kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this beautiful Lord's Day that you have blessed us with. Father, we're thankful for this opportunity that you've given us to assemble here this morning, to sing these songs to thee, to come to thee in prayer, and to study another lesson from thy word. We pray, Father, that each one of us is assembled here this morning for here for no other reason but to learn better how to serve thee. Father, we're thankful for all the many blessings that we receive from you each day, our food, our shelter, our clothing. But we're especially thankful, Father, for the blessing that we receive through your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we're thankful for our elders that we have here at Ephesus. We pray that you will be with them, continue to give them the wisdom they desire, that they may lead the congregation here in a way that will be well-pleasing to thee, and that they're, through their works that this word will be spread here and other parts of the world. Father, we're thankful for our deacons. We pray that you will be with them as they carry out their duties assigned to them each week. Father, we're thankful for... Robert and Matt, as they work here with us each week, we pray that you will give them a long and happy life in thy service. And we be, pray that you will be with Matt this morning as he presents his lesson. May he remember well the things he's prepared and present it in a way that be well pleasing to thee. Father, we're thankful for this country that we live in. We're thankful for all the freedoms that we enjoy. And we pray that you will be with our elected officials, that they will always look to you as, as they make these decisions, that these freedoms will always be ours to cherish. Father, we're thankful for the men and women that are serving our country at this time, both here in the States or other parts of the world. We pray that you will be with them, watch over them, protect them, and return them home safely, if it be thy will. Father, we're thankful for all of our young people that we have here at Ephesus. We pray that you will guide their steps throughout their lives, and they will always look to you for strength and guidance as they go through their life. Father, we're thankful for, the, for all of our mothers that are here today with as we celebrate our Mother's Day, we pray that you will be with them and strengthen them as they work and strive to provide for their family and care for them. Father, we 
pray that we will always be mindful of our mothers that are no longer with us. We are thankful for the guidance and the love that they gave us each day. Father, we pray that you will be with us now as we continue through this, our worship, through future lives such as we might have. Forgive us of our sins, Father, for it be thy will. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Number 125 will be our song before the lesson. Those of you who would like, like are welcome to stand for this song. 125. <laughs> truly good to be here on this Lord's Day. We have an excellent number and we are so glad that you are here and encouraged by your presence. Uh, I wanted to make a couple of announcements be, uh, before we begin. Uh, beginning this evening at 5 o'clock we will have a, uh, a little folks class uh, up front and uh, I'll start out teaching that and we will begin that this Sunday evening so bring come back please and uh, bring your children with you uh, as we have a, a short little Bible drill and, and lesson time uh, as mentioned before uh, about mothers and Mother's Day and we want to say uh, happy Mother's Day to you uh, I read this uh, a while back and uh, thought it was a good reminder to keep and uh, so I did uh, mothers teach us a lot of things. They teach us about logic. Uh, their logic is because I said so. That's why. They appreciate a job well done. If you're going to kill each other, do it outside. I just finished cleaning the house. They teach us about religion. They say you better pray that that will come out of the carpet. They do time travel. If you don't straighten up, I'm going to knock you into the middle of next week. They give us foresight. Make sure you wear clean underwear in case you're in an accident. They teach us about irony. Keep crying and I'll give you something to cry about. 
They teach us the science of osmosis. Shut your mouth and eat your supper. They teach us about contortionism. Will you just look at the dirt on the back of your neck? They teach us stamina. You'll sit there until all that spinach is finished. They taught us about the weather. It looks like a tornado has swept through your room. They taught us how to solve physics problems. If I, tell, if I yelled because I saw a meteor coming towards you, would you listen then? They taught us about hypocrisy. If I've told you once, I've told you a million times, don't exaggerate. They gave us the circle of life. I brought you into this world and I can take you out. They taught us behavior modification. Stop acting like your father. So we, we think about uh, mothers on this day that we here in America have declared as, as Mother's Day. I heard Denzel Washington say a, mother's, a mother is a son's first true love. A son, especially their first son, is a mother's last true love. For many today, we think about our mother, our grandmother, our mother-in-law. We honor them and think about them. We pray and thank God for them. And for many of us, this is a very joyous and happy time. For some, it is a numb time because while we think of mothers and grandmothers and mother-in-laws and great mother-in-laws or women of motherly influence upon our lives, some of them have departed and are absent from this day and absent from this time in our lives. But we think about them, and we truly do try to thank God for them. I want to take a little bit of time this, this morning and, and look at what can we learn about God from mothers and, and how mothers interact with us as, as children and how we were raised, and can we see likeness and similarities in that and God. Oftentimes we think about godly mothers and what we really mean by they were a, they're a godly mother is that they raised children who were godly people. And so when we examine through Scripture and we look at godly mothers, and God, godly mothers on this, in the Bible, we, we think about the outcome of their children and how they, how they resulted in being godly people. And we say, well, they must have been a godly mother because of the children that they raised. And, and many times we, we, raise, we are godly people and sometimes our kids make it a very difficult task to be godly mothers or even godly fathers. If we are blessed with a godly mother, we should give thanks to God because that we were taught early on how He would want us to live and how He would have us to live our lives. And He has blessed us with a godly mother who thought that that was the most important part about raising you. And when we look through the Bible, there's a lot of men and a lot of women who learned about God from their mother. And we think about uh, some of the godly mothers from the Bible. Uh, Jochebed went above and beyond to make sure that Moses' life was saved. She knew, in Exodus 2 we find out, that she knew that all of these children, these, these young boys, were going to be killed. And they, that he would certainly face death. He would be executed. He would be cut off. And, and so she thought of, well, what kind of thing could I do to have a chance for my son to live, for his life to continue? And so she went to the river and she, she snuck then in a basket, baby Moses, and, and laid him aside in the reeds so that Pharaoh's daughter might see him and he would have a chance for life in the riverbed. Mary was very confused at how she could be carrying a child in her womb. How is it that I have a child in my womb? I have this angel that comes to me and now it says that I'm going to bring forth the Son of God, that I'm going to bring forth the one who is going to save his people from his sins. I'm going to bring forth Emmanuel. How is all this going to happen? She's overwhelmed at all of these happenings and surrounding her and everything that's going on, but yet she nurtured the earthly body and brought into this world the earthly body of the Son of God and brought Him into raising Him into who He ought to be. Influenced and powered by God, she was to be the one responsible for raising up Jesus. Naomi showed self-sacrifice and compassion for others. To her daughter-in-law Ruth, who is also committed to Naomi's well-being, 
Naomi was not the mother-in-law that many people typically complain about. She was not the one that was always up in your business, although she was all up in the business of, we got to figure out how to get Ruth the husband. And what other mother-in-law, you know, what mother-in-law is going to set out to do that? we got to get you all. But she was motivated with love and desire to find that husband for Ruth. Ruth honored her and was committed to, to her being taken care of as well, not to leave her and not to abandon her. We see that she must have been some kind of great woman for that influence to carry on to someone who was her daughter by marriage and not by birth. Think about the faith of Lois and Eunice and how it was admired by Paul and, and impactful to their progeny, Timothy, and how he was raised up to be this godly person and how he would be uh, advocate for the gospel of Jesus Christ impacted by his grandmother and his mother. We, we find very little mentioned about his father, but we find much written about his mother and grandmother. And so their impact on his life and him becoming who he ought to be as a child of God. Well, these are some of the godly mothers from the Bible, and we could go on and on and on with a, a great long list of those, but it's not really what we're about this morning. Well, that's not our goal uh, in this study, but it's rather about learning about God and how these type of women and mothers can do that. When we think about mothers, I think the thing that separates a mother from anything else and anyone else is that they can give new life. Uh, bringing forth a child in this world is a superpower that no man can ever do. Now, I don't care what science tries to do or where science tries to go or where science tries to take this, a man will never be able to bring forth new life into this world. It's a rare superpower. It's something that, that, that is not understood by men. I remember when, when Haley was pregnant with, with Levi and I would come home and I would complain about my day. That was so dumb. I would come home and I, I would talk about what, what kind of day I had and what kind of misery I, I had ensued upon and what kind of misery had befallen me. And she's like, yeah, I know what you mean. I grew a hand today inside of me. That was pretty difficult. That was a rough go. But tell me about how your paperwork was messed up. <laughs> That's so important. But this is a rare superpower. Men can't do this. Men don't know what it's like to grow a child from inside of you or, or even have that ability. And men cannot relate to this. We, we think we go through it with you. And we talk about, oh yeah, we're pregnant. No, we are not. She is. So we, we see all of this and we understand that as a woman can bring forth new life, God brings forth a true change and a new life through Christ. This kind of new life is something that, although with all of the great superpower and miracle that God has given unto women, that, that no one can touch. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 4, it says this, Therefore we were buried with Him through baptism, into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. This new life that we have been given through Jesus Christ by God should be something that has changed us. We, we should be different. We should be made anew. We should feel refreshed. We should feel redeemed. As Nicodemus asked Jesus, can a man enter into his mother's womb a second time? Well, no. But the life that is given to us through Jesus Christ by God is something so new, so fresh, that we should feel amazed. Mothers give comfort. Mothers give such great comfort that fathers or men, we, we just can't relate to. In Isaiah chapter 66 and verse 12, it says, For thus says the Lord, Behold, I will extend peace to her like a river, and the glory of the Gentiles like a flowing stream, then you shall feed. On her side you shall be carried and be dandled by her kisses as one whom his mother comforts. So I will comfort you, and you shall be comforted in Jerusalem. 
it paints this image here of a mother coddling her baby and swaying from side to side and and I, as you see people and you hear you see a mother even though it maybe it's not her child and, and she hears that crying she oftentimes will look or, or tend an ear or or see what kind of aid that she could be and she begins to sway and try to comfort that and God says I will be like a mother to her child I will comfort you dear Jerusalem I will I will hold you I will call on you I will take care of you we know that the mother gives comfort. We know that, that there is a desire for a mother to comfort a child, and a child inherently knows that as soon as they were born. Because seldom ever, if ever, in the middle of the night, when there is a bad dog barking or attacking, or when the thunder rolls, do you hear a child cry out for daddy? No, it's never that. It's always mama. I want mama. A little boy got injured in, in Levi's uh, baseball game the other night. It wasn't real severe, and, and, uh, but he had fouled a ball off. It hit him in the cheekbone, and I, I ran up there. I said, are you okay? He kind of looked at me, and you could tell he was wanting to tough through it. You know, he, he was wanting to just, just make it through that. I said, your daddy's right here behind the fence. I said, you want to look at your daddy? Because I know what kind of daddy he's got. He's going to just say, you turn around and hit that ball. And it, he said... There's my mama. And I mean, it was over. He, he walked over there to the fence. He saw mama. And tears started to work up a little bit more, a little bit more fierce. She said, get your stuff. Come on, let's go. We'll go. We'll get out of here. See, see they know, we know that a mother is going to give comfort far more than what a father is going to give. Far more than even though the father is motivated and moved by love and compassion for their child, a mother is just automatically that way. And, and I think that's why God uses that similarity of how a mother treats her child. He doesn't bring forth and say, well, as a father treats his child, so I will hold you and, and put your legs around me on my hip and I will sway you back and forth and bless you with kisses because that's a mother's comfort. But the comfort of God will exceed even that of the comfort that we know and that we are familiar with. You say, we know how a mother comforts us and how, how she will hold us, but the way that God comforts it seeds even that which we are familiar with. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, at verse 3, it says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. We see that God is the great comforter and how He shows us through any tribulation that He will comfort us and that He will be there for us. And that we can learn from that and we can learn from God and we can also comfort others. But the only way that we know how to bestow comfort to others is because we learn that from God Himself that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble. God comforting us and teaching us, that is how we know how to comfort. I'm reminded of Philippians chapter 4, and verse 7, the peace which God supplies surpasses all comprehension. That is the peace that God supplies. We, we can't even fathom what kind of peace that, that God will give to us. And as offering up that comfort, and so many times that comfort is desired in moments of despair, and we desire protection. Mothers protect. Mothers take care and defend off. An angry mama protecting her babies. I just, I feel so sorry for you. It, 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 it is going to be a rough day for you, sir. If you have to deal with that mama that's protecting her babies. I think that's just a general reaction that God has given all mothers. That they inherently know, hey, I'm supposed to protect this. This is my baby. This is what I this is what I ought to protect. We call them kill deed. Y'all ever seen a kill deed before? Kill deer appropriate if you look it up in the dictionary. It's a little bird that likes to have eggs in rocks. So you may see them in the driveway and they'll nestle up a bunch of rocks and they have those, those eggs will blend in with the rocks. 
Well, you can find an, a nest to one of these birds about this time of year because as you wander and you get closer, you can hear that bird begin to cock at you. And they'll send off an alarm. It's just like, beep, 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 And then she gets hurt. Like she just, I mean, I don't know, I've never seen one, but they'll get hurt and they'll flop that wing around and they'll, they'll begin to get on their side and they'll shake a little bit and she'll walk off a little bit and you'll get distracted and you'll start following after her. And you, what she's doing is she is leading her away from your ba her babies. You see, she knows where her nest is and she has hidden her nest. So she goes and she says, you're getting too close to my babies. And so she runs you away. It's this idea right here when a predator comes that they'll be distracted by her and her acting. And they'll seek out after her and they'll forget about her babies. They'll forget about her eggs. And they do this all on their own. They'll begin to do this. And then they, they'll finally, if you get close enough and you're, you're, you're pointed enough that I'm going to find the nest because you're not going to get distracted by her. If you get up close enough to that nest, even though you kind of walk, well, okay, now I'm going to come back right here to where she was. Her and her little bitty old bird will puff up and bow her wings out and look at you and make all kinds of racket like you ain't never heard. Because she's going to protect her babies. She's going to take care of them. Jesus gives the analogy when looking at Jerusalem of how a chicken will gather out and she will call her chicks underneath her wings and how she will give up her life. Whether from fire or storm or hawk or man, she will gather her babies underneath her wings. In Matthew chapter 23 and verse 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. He said, I called for you. I beckoned you to come. I opened up my wings. I gathered around. I was ready to protect you. I was ready to shelter you, but you wanted nothing to do with me. You stoned, the very, uh, the, you stoned those who I sent to tell you about me. You are all ready. You desire me. You want me. But when I come to you, when I send for you, you want nothing to do with me. You were not willing to be protected. The instinct of mom is to protect life. God is the source of protection for His children. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 3, But the Lord is faithful who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. God protects us from the evil one. He is the one who is setting up a shelter. He is the one who is standing, who is standing up and being the stone wall and fortress about me. He shelters those who will flee to him. How many times did David ride or David flee into the mountains and hide within the caves and he called out to God and likened him to the mountain and the rock of which he was standing in and being the fortress of which he would lean on. God is that protection when we are under attack. If we will seek out after him and long for him and desire for him, just as a mother would protect her own baby and just as that little that chicken will gather her, hen, her little chicks underneath her wings, just as God stands up to protect David in the mountain, he will protect us. He is the one who guards us from the evil one, who sets a barrier around us and protects us. A mother has a love that will not forget. A love that will not forget. Mothers will remember the children and they will continue to love them. Well, I know, I know he... I know he's real dumb sometimes, but he's my baby. I, I still love him. Yeah, sometimes I won't take him out of this world, but, you know, I, I still love him. Isaiah 49 and verse 14. But, but Zion said, The Lord has forsaken me, and my Lord has forgotten me. 
can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, yet I will not forget you. So it's this right here. How crazy would it be for a mother to forget her child? And to forget the one she carried for all that time in her womb and, and had compassion for and nursed up and, and grew and, and helped him become who they ought to be. And he said, well, even if they may forget, I will not forget you. I will, I will not forget you. You see, as, as true as a mother's love is, she is still human. A mother's love is still there. And if for some reason, and sad be the day when due to age or health issues that mom forgot who I was. She no longer remembered me or remembered my name. We are comforted to know that had she remembered, she would still love us, and she still does. Even though her memory has faded away. But God said, my love will remain forever. Even though those things may happen with our earthly mother, God said, I, I will never forget you. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will always be there. I will always love you. Love that will not forget you and forget his own, and he will always know those who are His. And although they will always remember us, sometimes we forget where we come from. You know, we should remember where our life comes from. We should remember about our life, how we got here. But sometimes we get so caught up in the world and, and we forget those things and I, and I believe that's why there was such distinction placed aside for a day like today it said you may you may run through life was so busy and, and, and get older and and run through and be having this over here and that over there and being so overwhelmed but we need to set apart a day where we can remember mom make sure that we remember mom we do something nice for mom I told Haley yesterday to make sure she got all that housework done yesterday so she could have the day off. <coughs> we, need to remember, we, we need to remember our mother. And so we kind of have this day here where it's like, well, you need to remember that. And every first day of the week, we, we come together so that we can remember what God has done for us. Because sometimes we just get so caught up in the world and not necessarily even that is sin. Not necessarily that we're just off living sinful lives and that we're, we're enjoying all this folly that Satan has given to us and that we're just so overwhelmed by all that. It's just that we just do other stuff that's not necessarily in and of itself sinful. We just get caught up that we forget how we got here. And, and we, we, we just fail to remember Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 18, Of the rock who begot you, you are mindful and have forgotten the God who fathered you. I think sometimes we just get sidetracked and forget. Now, if we are point blank asked the question, do you believe in God? Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Do you believe that Jesus' blood on the cross will save you? I don't know very many people that will say, no, they will agree to that. I, I know that. I know that is a fact. I know that is the truth. But when we go and we just get caught up with everything else and we forget about God and we forget about Jesus and we forget about our brothers and sisters in Christ and we forget about caring for them, have we forgotten the God who fathered us? It is not of flesh and blood that makes us a child. It is not that of flesh and blood that makes you your mother's child. It's that you were raised and loved by them and nurtured by them and grown by them. You think about, think about Mary and how she raised up this child who, who really she had no part of. You think about Joseph. He, he's just here along for the ride. 
here is this child that we will raise and we will honor and we will give to God who will then become our Savior as well. And we too, it is not flesh and blood and some genealogy or, or some ancestry.com thing that we can link back that's going to make us God's children, but it's how we were loved and how we were raised and how He showed that to us. In John chapter 1 and verse 12, But as many as received Him, to them He gave the light to become children of God. To those who believe in His name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but they were born of God. It is this. We cannot forget the one who gave His life for me and that we remember the gift that God has given us and we should remember that that gift of Jesus is how we have newness of life and that is where our very life comes from we, honoring God should be our utmost goal for any of us in our lives every day what can I do to honor God today what can I do to bring him glory today and if we set that out as our goal every day, it's going to be hard not to remember God because that's our ultimate goal. Bring Him glory. Bring Him honor. And we see that our earthly mother has shown us some physical attributes of God and, and the way that she loves, the way that she gives life, the way that she's our comforter and protector and, and how she loved us even before we knew we could love her back same that goes for God and how that he loved us while we were still yet sinners rejecting him and denying him and we cannot get to heaven or please God simply just because our mother loved us or because we loved her great mothers awesome mothers it doesn't matter that doesn't have anything to do with it yes it may have to do with how you're raised and your chances to obey the gospel and so forth and so on but at the end of the day man woman boy, girl, child, mother, father, sister, brother, whatever the case may be, you will answer to God and to God alone. And it will have nothing to do with your mother and her love for you or whether you loved her. It will have to do with your faith in Jesus Christ. Only through the blood of Jesus are we called children of God. Only through that adoption that is found in the blood of Jesus Christ and only His children will He welcome home. And this morning we have an opportunity for you to also become a child of God for you to have that newness of life by being washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come as we stand and as we sing.
Thank you for an excellent lesson, Brother Matt. <clears throat> Our closing song will be number 101. We'll sing the first and last verses of that in just a moment. Uh, Brother Matt mentioned the children's class will be beginning this evening. Uh, this is one of several things that we've talked about, both with the elders and with the deacons. Uh, I would encourage you to bring your young children to be in this class. It's been a number of years since we've had the little kids' class, as I used to call it. Uh, but it's a wonderful thing, and it's, it's, uh, it will help give your kids a foundation to base their life on. So I strongly encourage you to bring your children for that. Another thing uh, we want to let you know that we've discussed, uh, all of you know from time to time we have, for lack of a better term, we have beggars to come in, and they most of the time will come into the foyer there, and... Uh, we, since the pandemic, moved the contribution trays right out there, so it's just right in plain view. And we've discussed this actually a few times uh, in, in recent months, but we made the decision starting next Sunday, those trays will be moved inside the auditorium and not out in the foyer, so it's not quite so visible for the beggars. Uh, we've had one beggar come in here before that she, she worked the congregation over better than anybody I've ever seen. And I can just imagine if that lady come in and saw that tray of money there, she would think she hit the jackpot. So we have made the decision. We'll be moving them inside. So next Sunday when you come, please do bring your contribution and please do put it in the tray. But it will be in actually by the control booth back there. So you'll be able to see it without any problem coming in. Again, thank you for your presence. Uh, we have had a wonderful service this, this morning. We'll sing the first and last verses of number 101, and then Brother Steve Lovell will lead us in our closing prayer. <coughs> Yeah, you. 